Thanks for joining us this week on Email Geeks at Home Drinking Coffee. Join your hosts, Chris Marriott and Paul Schreiner each week as they talk email marketing, life, purpose, faith, but mainly email marketing. If you're looking for some normalcy in these crazy times, you've come to the right place. Welcome back to Email Geeks at Home Drinking Coffee. We're gr glad to have you. My name is Paul Schreiner. I work with a company called Audience Point, where we do some cool email stuff. With me, my colleague today, as always, the one and only Chris Marriott. Hello, great to see you all uh, this week. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and Paul, I noted that little ad advertisement you did at the beginning. I think you know, any anywhere, anytime. That's the deal, Chris. Uh, well, I, that was very good. Um, and uh, and now I feel like I have to do it. And uh, I work for Email Connect. Uh, and uh, we help enterprise brands with the uh, RFP process for ESP. Anyway, we your, have a your, your story there was much better than mine, even though it felt a little me too. You know what I mean? Well, it was me too. It was not a little bit me too. It was 100% me too. Anyway, uh, anyway we, have a, we have a really great guest for you today, Dr. Scott Zeller. Uh, he's got a great story and uh, we don't want to waste any time uh, getting to it, so we're going to go over to Scott now. And uh, as always, tune into the after show for hijinks, shenanigans, and of course, uh, some time, quality time with fan favorite producer David Inman. Exactly. All right, we'll exactly. see you after the show. So we're back here with, with Dr. Scott Zeller, uh, and we're delighted you're here today. A little background on Scott, and then we'll let him talk, obviously, Though this show is sometimes challenging for our guests to get a word in edgewise, uh, Paul. But Scott has been uh, involved in emergency medical, emergency psychiatry for over 30 years. Um, he's been involved in writing a number of textbooks on the subject of emergency psychiatry and with a particular focus on agitation. Um, he's led both US and international guideline projects on the subject, and he was named National Council on Behavior Health, that easy for me to say, on behavior, behavior. Behavioral Health, uh, 2015 USA Doctor of the Year for his groundbreaking work in revolutionizing emergency medical health care worldwide. And sorry for botching that, that uh, 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 council, but uh, those are big words for me. But Scott, welcome. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, I, think the, I think where I'd, li I'd like to start, uh, not giving Paul a uh, word in edgewise, is... Um, Talk a little bit about your specialty. Well, I mean, let, let, let's, let's roll back the clock um, because again, a, a emergency psychiatry, and you know, everybody knows about emergency room doctors, everybody knows about psychiatrists, but they have rarely <clears throat> see those two words together. And I think that's probably why so much of your work has been groundbreaking and has been um, so important to uh, uh, the world of medicine. But talk about how you got into medicine and then more specifically, what took you down the path of emergency psychiatry? Oh, well, great question. Uh, so pretty much when I was in medical school, I, I was like so many medical students trying to sort between different specialties and trying to figure out, okay, where am I gonna go? What is my passion? What's my interest? And I really didn't figure out until my senior year uh, of medical school that psychiatry really seemed like the, the, the best place for me. and. Even back then, psychiatry was a very uh, much still Freudian and psychodynamic and based on things like that. But there was this emerging science that was becoming a part of it and psychopharmacology that was becoming a part of it that I found really fascinating. And the opportunity that we could help people who were truly suffering uh, with, with medications and with medical input uh, was the thing that really drove me to go into psychiatry was like, you know, it, 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 talk therapy is a wonderful, wonderful thing, and I don't ever minimize that, but there was also this different aspect that recognized that the brain is an organ too, just like the kidney or the lungs, and maybe we can help people using good medical science to, to change that brain chemistry when, it, when things aren't going so well and really make things better for folks, and that was what drove me into psychiatry in general. And then when I started doing psychiatry, I really became very interested in the what, what we might call acute psychiatry, which is when people are having very, very difficult times and you might be hallucinating and hearing voices in your head that are telling you 
to hurt family members, for example. And mm -hmm. the interesting thing about that is, is if you look at a brain scan, when they're hearing voices in their head, and you've probably, everybody's heard about somebody hearing voices, though they're not, uh, th those aren't artificial, th those aren't a delusion. The part of your brain that's lighting up right now, listening to me talk, the people who have schizophrenia, for example, when they're hearing voices, that same part of their brain is lighting up. They are literally hearing voices. And when those voices become command, when they right. start telling them to do nasty things, that's where emergency psychiatry gets involved. And so what, what, what's really different about emergency psychiatry is there's been a long held tradition that if you're in the talk therapy office or you're in the community clinic and you start talking about suicide, you start talking about killing people, you start talking about hurting others, you start talking about damage, all these other kinds of things. Historically, they would just say, okay, we're calling 911. And then when they call 911, there's pretty much two choices. You either go to jail or you go to the nearest ER. And then unfortunately, when they go to the nearest ER, they don't have a lot to offer them except heavy sedation, restraints, uh, five point restraints, uh, wrists, ankles, belly, leather to a gurney and heavily sedation, sedated until you get transferred to an inpatient psychiatric facility. And what we really have found with emergency psychiatry that's been so amazing is that if you have somebody who is that severe, who's that acute and change the approach that 75, 80% of them end up not needing to go to an inpatient bed. We can help them get better in less than a day, in a matter of hours. And nobody, when I was first going into psychiatry, thought that was possible. And now we've proved that it does and, and we're spreading that word around the world. That's fantastic. Wow, that is truly amazing. Um, it, and, and I don't want to get us off track, but that's part of the charm of this show because I realize, and Paul's smiling, I was so interested in getting into uh, your background that I, I neglected one of our traditions, Paul. And which tradition was that? Would you care to remind me? What are you drinking? What am I drinking? Uh, so, uh, Scott, we'll start with you. What are you drinking? Well, uh, it's a little late in the day for me for coffee, so I've moved on to a monster, non-carb, zero-calorie energy drink. Excellent. Paul, what are you drinking? Uh, I'm drinking some Aldi's uh, coffee today. We have, uh, I'm, I'm saving my last batch of Boon Buna beans for uh, later on in the season. Pretty excited uh -huh. about that, so uh, slumming it today. And I'm drinking... <laughs> As usual, from the beautiful tropical island of the Dominican Republic, Gorgeous Santo, place. Santo Domingo coffee, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, a, a taste of Caribbean vacation um, that was so brutally snatched from Paul. Scott, you, you, you aren't aware of this, but Paul and his wife were uh, right before the lockdown were due to go on an all expense paid trip to uh, the Dominican Republic. Uh, and um, uh, Punta Cana, in fact. Right. Uh, you know, we have five kids. You can see them in pictures behind me here. But this vacation was Song's kids, and uh, right. unfortunately, it was canceled. And uh, so Paul can only dream of what might have been. And unfortunately, I, I didn't choose this coffee to rub it in week in and week out. But on the other hand, I, I don't choose to avoid rubbing it in. Week right. In and week yeah, out. smart, smart. <laughs> so anyway. Um, um, so getting, getting back to uh, the subject at hand, um, what I found, one of the things I found it, uh, fascinating, in, and I was even talking to my wife about this, she has elder, elderly parents um, in, with, with both who are dealing with uh, both Alzheimer's and dementia, and um, we, Paul and I were listening to one of the podcasts that you, or maybe the only other podcast we've done that we found, and just a fascinating story I mean, because, you know, you know I, I talked about how you were an expert on agitation and, and, you, and you hear that right. as a lay person and you go, you know, expert on agitation, somebody's agitated, whatever. But you were talking about, and I'd love, to, I'd love to hear it again in your words, you were talking about how so many patients, particularly those with dealing with dementia, um, will often come into emergency room and with, with states of extreme agitation and that the sort of standard uh, um, reaction to that by ER doctors was, well, this patient's also got schizophrenia and, and uh, that's why there's this issue. And, and now they go back to the nursing home or the care facility and, and they're, they're mislabeled with a, 
with some sort of mental illness that they don't have because there was another cause. We'll talk a little bit about that because, again, I, I found that a fascinating story. No, no, that's, that's an interesting thing. And it actually makes it very difficult sometimes to, te to, to treat elderly uh, patients with agitation because there's this natural default historically to say, okay, they're agitated, so it must be due to a mental illness. So all of a sudden, somebody who's 85 years old, who lives in a nursing home, and this morning threw their breakfast tray at a nurse, and now they suddenly caught schizophrenia, <laughs> which is you know, it, which is a little crazy because schizophrenia usually its onset is between 18 and 21. It, it's never happening when somebody's 80 years old, for example. Right. But but so what is happening all the time when you have somebody who's got this kind of unprecedented agitation in that age group is over 75% of them have a urinary tract infection. And, and everybody's looking for this psychiatric reason they're acting up and nobody's checking their urine to see that they're spilling lots of white blood cells and they're actively infected and you treat the infection and bada bing, they're in great shape again and they go back home. The problem becomes that nursing home, once they drop that schizophrenia label on them, the nursing home says, wait, we can't treat people with those diagnoses. And then all of a sudden they don't have a place to go. Yeah. And those, the, the, the weird thing about those diagnoses is that they have a life of their own on the charts. I can't tell you how many patients that I've seen that have been diagnosed with schizophrenia somewhere in the past, and this will linger on as a, as a black mark more than anything you can possibly imagine. Like it's right. stuck, like all of a sudden they have schizophrenia and you go see the patient that goes, there's no history of this. These people never had it. Why are they diagnosed with this? But they're stuck with it and it prevents them from getting other kinds of care they need. Yeah, those labels are not always our best friends. The number of folks I know who fight to keep just any kind of diagnosis label off of them because even with HIPAA, it seems to follow us. Very true. So, uh, so another thing that, that I've seen you talk about, um, which, I, which again, I thought was, was fascinating, and I, and, and I do want to get to what's it like being an expert of your field uh, in the, and in the medical profession during the time of the pandemic. But before we get there, um, you, you, you were, you've pointed out in the past that there's a huge shortage, and, and I, I'd never heard of this before, but there was, a, there was a huge shortage of psychiatrists in the US. And something like more than half the psychiatrists in the country are over 55 years old, which by a demographic uh, timeline means it's not gonna get better anytime soon. How do you explain this? What, 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 when did psychiatry stop being cool? Jason Seaver <laughs> is the answer, Chris. Jason Seaver from Growing Pains. Oh, right. <laughs> he made it look so easy. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I thank you for thinking that psychiatry was ever cool, because I don't remember <laughs> when that was. <laughs> but, <clears throat> yeah, I think there was a... Um, here's one of the things that we deal with, of those of us who are psychiatrists that we deal with all the time is that there's so many other uh, specialists in mental health that we get kind of lumped in with them and none of them went to medical school. So people assume that we're one of them as well. And, and it, there, there's a strange kind of uh, problem with being a psychiatrist. And every one of my colleagues and myself have, have dealt with this many times like, oh, you're a psychologist, right? You never went to medical school. Or mm -hmm. I can even remember one time being at a party, this was, 30 years ago and I was still young and somebody came to get me saying somebody had fell down and they were concerned they'd broken their leg and they said Scott come come see him and somebody some wag in the corner said what's he going to do talk him out of his pain <laughs> wags so it's like hey you know I went to medical school we actually had that part you know where, where people get hurt and I try to do something to help them out but you know, you're not gonna tell him. But that, that, that attitude is pervasive even yeah. among other medical specialists. And I think that became a, kind of a disincentive for people to go into psychiatry for many years. And the good news is, is that in the last five to 10 years, psychiatry has become a very in-demand specialty for residency programs. Sure. And I think a lot of this, what we call integration back into medicine has been driving that where people say, hey, you know, I can be a physician and a psychiatrist as well. Yeah. I'm not going into this so that I would be a psychotherapist, which once again, psychotherapy is great, but if you've got a medical degree, perhaps you can do more. And I right. think the people who are going into psychiatry now 
are ones who want to do more and, and find that bridge between the psychodynamic and the medical fields. And that's, that's where all the interesting stuff is. And that's, that's where it's fun to practice. That, sure. That's what I really like about emergency psychiatry because the neatest thing about the kind of work that we do is if you're like a, a, a psychotherapist, you might take months to see your patient improve before your eyes, but we get to see it in a matter of hours. Right. I, I, can, I can treat somebody who's screaming, yelling, calling me every name in the book and get them started on treatment, started on medications. And a few hours later, they come back and they say, hey, doc, you're doing much better. Thanks for everything. Sorry about what I said about your mother. <laughs> and everything's great. So. That's awesome. Well, it's, it's good to know that, in that uh, the shortage may, may only be uh, short-lived. Um, notice I said live, Paul, not short-lived. Short I did. I You're reading your notes word for word, phonetically. Smart. No. Uh, Very uh, smart, Maria. But what, so, uh, and Paul, I'll get you, I'll let you eventually get a word in edgewise. But um, Scott, the, uh, what about neuroscience? That's become this huge thing, it, at least as a layman. You know, my, my daughter uh, was very into neuroscience and she graduated uh, not too long ago from school. Um, neuroscience seems to have come out of nowhere uh, and, and, or at least perceived by me to come out of nowhere. How, how, how is psychiatry and neuroscience, are, are you different roads to the same destination? Do you, do you work together? Uh, are, are they compatible sort of views of the brain? Uh, it's a great question because uh, actually, if you even get board certified in psychiatry, it's under the American Board of Neurology and Psychiatry. These are supposed to be compatible and o compatible and overlapping sciences. Sometimes there's a lot of pushback from one or the other. Oh, a neurologist will say, "I don't do uh, psychotherapy." A psychiatrist will go, "I don't care about the brain cells. I just want to know what this person thinks about their parents." <laughs> uh, but, but I think the, the more evolving thing is to really uh, think of everything is integrated. Again, uh, that the brain is an organ in the body and is going to be affected by anything that happens, just like your liver or your heart or your lungs is going to be. And the more you recognize that and, and try to bring this collaborative, integrated approach into a, a modern way, you're going to see more than that. But the neuroscience, like you said about your daughter, is the most fascinating part about it to me and we're getting down to molecular level we're getting down to neural pathways levels uh, everything that we're seeing that's happening even the, the the meds that we use in psychiatry now are so better targeted to neuroreceptors where we used to pretty much use a sledgehammer and now we use tweezers right and that's so cool and it means that we're actually trying to attack what the pathology is but avoid a lot of those heavy-handed side effects that, that gave psychiatry a, 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 and actually a well-deserved bad reputation as a result. So I have a, a pile-on question here, a little different, and it comes from my, my hippie, hippie background. So along the lines of psychiatry, neuroscience, my hippie friends are all talking about mushrooms as they fit into that. Do you have an opinion on it? I'd love, 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 love to hear because there, there's, I think, a lot we don't know about these things. No, it's actually very interesting. And I, I've been to, uh, to several, uh, see several speakers who talk about hallucinogens and that they actually may have an active role in healing and, and be very positive for people who have psychiatric issues. And uh, right uh, across the uh, county line from where I live right now, Oakland's very near making mushrooms legal. Oh, is that right? Yeah, so, so it's very clear. And a lot of that is driven actually by people saying there, there is a therapeutic role for mushrooms. Right. And, and so if they could be good for your, 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 your individual patient, maybe they're okay for the population in general. So I've also seen people do this with LSD, with ecstasy, with all kinds of different kind of uh, hallucinogenic drugs. Mm -hmm. And some of the really interesting things have come from people who undergo psychotherapy while under the effects of these drugs, and how they're really <laughs> able to resolve oh, a lot right? of serious um, because, issues that they've been dealing with because suddenly they have more clarity. Right, they can get into their more head in touch more. With their feelings. Again, the, the, this is what goes back to the Chris's earlier question about the neuroscience. 
is that there's so we're we're so just scratching the surface so far. Right. And the more we find out about what doors open because you uh, use a different chemical or or, or try a different thing that, that's going to change neural pathways, it's it's amazing and it's fascinating and and I'm glad I'm I'm alive to be able to see these things happen because you had an inkling about it. You you maybe found out mm -hmm. about it a bit when you're in college, let's say. And now you're saying like, wow, maybe some of the stuff we, we thought during those late night sessions really is coming right. to fruition. These cool. things are amazing. Yeah. I, I can't speak for Paul, but but I, I, when I was at college, which was around the same time as you, Scott, obviously, um, or I, obviously Scott, Scott and I went to high school together. Oh, um, really? Did you guys swim to together? That. Stop it. <laughs> yes, we did. You know, you can't tell Paul anything, Scott. Anyway, but there, when, I went, when I went to school, we took it as an article of faith, and I don't even know where this came up from, but, you know, that, you know, if you took LSD seven times, you were certified insane, that, that you would, that you were literally, so, you know, all, only people who didn't mind being certified insane would be experimenting with LSD. At right, because you only get seven shots. Because the rest yeah. of us believed it, right. And then you'll have flashbacks your entire life. Right, 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 right. right. So, so was there any truth to the seven times or six times you take it, you're certifiably insane? Or was that just campfire talk? No, no, uh, that, that was campfire talk. Uh, oh. there, there's, 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 I have yet to see any science to back that up. I do remember a great Dragnet episode, though, where uh, there was a concerned mother who found out that her son had used LSD, and she was like, well, at least it's not marijuana. Right, right. At least it's not. Now, I heard this thing about going blind too at campfire again. Uh, yeah, 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 that's that's a different episode, Paul. Uh, <laughs> one that I hope we never get to. <laughs> Seriously, um, I do want to. Uh, I do want to talk uh, a little bit current events. I think that'd be helpful. Your specialty is around um, agitation. You know, handling it, dealing with it, recovering from it. Sort of all of those pieces. And in our pre-call couple things came up. One was uh, sort of COVID-19, people stuck at home. What impact has that had? Um, but also uh, sort of the protests around Black Lives Matter, all of that. Love to, love to sort of scratch that itch a little bit with you. Oh, sure. So, so it's been very intriguing in that recently, uh, you know, there's been a lot of concern about you know, so we do we do all aspects of emergency psychiatry, which agitation is obviously a big part, but, but there's other things that we do like suicide or what happens if your life is totally disruptive and you feel despondent, or if you have an acute manic episode and you're bipolar or you're despondent. There, there's all different aspects of, of what is a very severe mental health or behavioral health condition that ends up with you in the hospital, and that's, that's where my specialty comes in. Uh, but... I think a lot of the things that we have established over the last decade or so are becoming uh, very much uh, discussed and to the forefront because of some of the concerns about the way police interact with the general population. Where they, there's, uh, that they're too brusque, that there's only one way they react, which is handcuffs and slamming you to the ground. And so people have been saying, what about de-escalation? Sure. And that's just a word that gets tossed around. Well, we were, uh, I, I guess, fortunate enough to be uh, you know, one of the people who were just really talking about de-escalation and, and teaching techniques early on. So some of our training videos that we created that's that are used by the World Health Organization around the globe to, to help people learn how to do de-escalation, I've just noticed those ones that, that are on YouTube have just skyrocketed in numbers of views recently. They're not near Gangnam style yet, but watch out. Yeah, <laughs> right. It should be pretty close. One of Paul's um, favorite, actually. Yeah, but, but yeah people, exactly. People are really interested, like, like how do you do this? And, you know, de-escalation, the one thing that's funny, because I, I teach it a lot, and you're, how do you react to somebody who's very aggressive, who's very anxious, who's very agitated? And, and how can you help somebody like that calm down and interact with you in, in, a, in a different way without having to resort to calling security and having them slammed to the ground. Mm -hmm. And there's some basic techniques that it's so funny because when you, you teach them people, they go, oh, that's just common sense. And it's like, okay, but everybody forgets common sense in right. the heat of the moment. And there's some easy, easy ways that you can do this. So 
one of the things that was really neat that I was involved in uh, about a decade ago was something we called Project Beta, uh, you know, capital B-E-T-A, which stood for Best Practices in the Evaluation and Treatment of Agitation. And up to that point, the standard default treatment of hospitals, police departments, everybody around was, if somebody's agitated, the only way you can safely treat them is get a big group of people to jump on top of them, slam them to the ground, and put their wrists, ankles, and into leather restraints and then pull their pants down and give them three needles in their naked rear end and knock them unconscious for 24 hours. And that was the safe way to do things. Sounds like college to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what we did with Project Beta and then we did a multi-center study with 40 wonderful individuals and worked for 18 months on it and published it. Uh, fortunately, rather than the psychiatry and actually an emergency medicine journal was that you know what, you're gonna get better outcomes if you focus everything around de-escalation. And you can learn some sick, simple techniques to help people calm down and help people regain control. That was one of the interesting things we found out about it, is that we, had, we did one study where we asked people who'd been through a really bad, severe agitation episode, if they could do uh, kind of a drawing of their episode and with the, the Y graph being Oh, wait, I'm getting that wrong. The X graph being the time and the Y graph being the severity of their agitation. And so it was always kind of this sawtooth going up. And then they'd get to the very tip top of where they were the most agitated. And to a person, everybody said when they were most agitated, they would circle that and they'd say, here's where I lost control. And so we started thinking, wow, if agitation means to everybody losing control, Maybe the secret to reducing agitation is helping them to regain control. Again, it doesn't sound like that groundbreaking or anything beyond common sense, but the idea is around how can you help people regain a sense of control? So some of it is as simple as offering choices. Hey, are you hungry or thirsty? Do you wanna to go to a different room? Would you like to sit down? Do you, do you want, to, want some place to go lie down? Do you wanna go somewhere that's dark? Do you wanna hear some music? All these different things that offer choices. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, when you're offering choices, you picking a choice, whether it's just yes or no, is all of a sudden you exerting control. And that's a really neat thing. And nobody ever really thought of that. that that's, it just seems like a no-brainer. But the more you give people the opportunity to choose what happens next, the more they regain control, and the more they calm down, and the more they relax. And then you, you start working on collaborating and doing things together to help them get better and get through the rest of the crisis. So that's basically the philosophy. It's my, my wife is a trauma social worker and the story she tells me are hat in hand with what you're saying, just around, um, you know, giving the, uh, the person choices. What would you like? How can I help you today? Because, you know, so much of it is their life is in chaos and giving them some, some hope in the form of control is powerful, super right. powerful. And so many of these folks, because there's a part of you that kicks into that fight or flight mechanism, as you know, and if everybody around you seems to be against you and attacking you, what are you going to do? You either want to run or you're going to fight. And we don't want you to do either of those things. Right. But we want to reduce all those feelings so that you start feeling like you have options beyond fight. Well, and to me, that would almost seem to indicate, because I, again, I think, it, I think what you're talking about as you said, it, it, it sounds, you know, it, you weren't saying it sounds easy, but it sounds like, you know, it, it, it's not a hard concept to, to say why, why shouldn't that work? Of course that should work. But, but the actual, you know, execution of that is potentially not easy, right. you know, and, and we don't ask our police, you know, when, when there's a hostage negotiation, you bring in the hostage negotiator, you bring in the guy trained, um, you know, to me, what this, what this would seem to indicate is, is that, you know, is that that the potentially we need to tr we, we need a, a certain type of, of of police officer or officers trained in de-escalating not not just hostage situations but another group de de-escalating situations where it's merely you know an agitated a person who who you know may seem crazy at the moment and a threat to himself or herself or someone else, but really is just someone who, who rather than tasing or taking down violently, could, could with the, somebody with the right training could 
ha have a different outcome that is much safer for everybody involved. Nobody's being lunged at with a knife or anything else. No, no, you couldn't be more on target with that. And, and what the amazing thing is, is that we find the vast majority of people who are agitated that if you confront them by saying, hey, stop that, or if you don't do that, we're calling in the troops and we're all gonna tackle you, all that does is agitate them more, right? Right, right. So if, if you change the approach, you're talking about the vast majority of people calming down, getting better, and, and being willing to what you were just calling negotiate, but, but we would call just collaboratively discuss things and, and get through it. And, and, and once you just restore that respect and, and the calmness to individuals, everybody gets through it and there, nobody gets hurt. And then that, that, it's a win-win. Yep. Well, it sounds like then, then your voice will be, <coughs> your voice and, 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 and your specialty's voice is of, uh, will of increasing importance as we evaluate how we handle some of these confrontations between police and civilians. And, um, and, and that you, whether your advice, your training, your what, whatnot, you know, it sounds like, again, it's gonna be a very important going forward, uh, you know, or, or, the, or the, the smarter police departments would be wise to, to bring a, a Scott Zeller on board to, to uh, help them develop new policies and procedures for dealing with, again, not violent criminals, um, you know, we don't want, but, but for dealing with, again, with people who, who are, you know, not right in the head at that moment in time, but that could be, that can be fixed in ways that are non-lethal, non-violent. Yeah, and, and, and just to be fair, they, they are doing that in a number of police departments around the country. They do something called CIT, which is Crisis Intervention Training, which mm -hmm. should include a lot of de-escalation. Seen some of the trainings, some of them are wonderful and have tons of, of de-escalation. Others are more how to defend yourself when somebody attacks you. And I right. don't think that's, that's really the right thing. I, right. I've seen crisis intervention training where you go in basically onto judo mats and, and see how to parry different you know, uh, people's attacks. And the, the bad part about that is, is when, once you learn that, then people are almost eager to try it out. Yes. And you might forget about the best thing is to never get in that situation in the first place and learning some of those basic de-escalation techniques. But there are people out there trying it. I think there's a lot of police departments that do. It's a program that started in Memphis about 20, 25 years ago. Sure. The, the crisis intervention training, and it's spread uh, around the country, uh, but it's still not really getting out to every police department or every right. officer, and, and, and it will do better once, once people are really embracing it. Right. So more work to be done there, but it, but it sounds like at least they're, it, it's heading in, in a better direction in many places. Well, I would hope so. Uh, you know, there's still a, a bit too much of, you know, these are bad guys and they deserve what they get. I think one of the things that we really try to teach when, when we're working uh, with, with different individuals on, on how to respond to psychiatric emergencies is stop thinking these are bad people. These are not bad people. These are just everyday people who are having bad symptoms of bad psychiatric illness. It's not their fault. They're, they're just, you know, you, you wouldn't go up to somebody who has cancer and say, stop having cancer, you know? But, but people actually will say that, like, stop having symptoms of your psych illness. We're like, well, I'm having symptoms of my illness. You have to realize that these are things beyond there is somebody's control. And, and if you understand it and, and help them to work within it and, and get better, then, then it's going to be better for everybody involved and everybody's going to be safe. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> You know, now I want to do a bit of a transition here. Uh, you know, it, it, we, we called this episode, you know, uh, and this is part of an Unbreakable series for those of you who've been watching uh, season two, uh, or at least paying attention. And we call this Unbreakable Dedication, and, and, uh, this episode. And I think to this yeah. point, you know, if you were, if, if you've been watching you would, or listening, you would say, yeah, well, this guy's incredibly dedicated. I can Smart. see why called him that. Smart and, and groundbreaking in many yeah. ways. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but what makes uh, Scott incredible, and 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 really what what you know the other reason we wanted him to talk today, um, because we got again there's a bigger story to Scott than than Scott the groundbreaking uh, psychiatric emergency room doctor, but you wouldn't find that out. We found it was very hard for us to even figure this out. If you Google uh, Scott, 
uh, you're unlikely to stumble across um, really uh, a personal battle that he's fighting at, at the same time he's doing all this outstanding stuff. And frankly, I only stumbled across it when, uh, you know, that, that uh, award uh, 2015 uh, National Doctor of the Behavioral, oh, I got it there, um, award <laughs> came with a $10,000 um, uh, uh, prize. And it said that, that, that Scott had donated that to a uh, foundation, the Multiple Myeloma Foundation, and uh, you know, subsequently learned that, that he had done that because, Scott, you yourself are battling multiple myeloma. And the, the research, and I'm going to have Scott talk about it because as, from a medical point of view, uh, I can only say that you know, in looking at it uh, and doing some research on it, um, it, it, is, it is a very tough condition to deal with and it's remarkable um that that scott is doing everything that you just heard at the same time battling multiple myeloma so so scott and i know we were not ambushing him folks we, we he knew we were going to bring this up um and he, he was you know gracious. we do have the ambush questions as well <laughs> well yeah that, that's the lightning round at the end but uh, we're not ambushing him here uh, another thing that makes scott an incredible person is while apparently he you know he doesn't want to be defined by this in his medical field, and that's why it's very hard to link it to him um, by looking at Google. Um, it's nevertheless something he's battling. So, Scott, talk a little bit about the diagnosis. What, what, what is it? What does it do? Um, and and how how you're able to, you know, live, you know, and do what you do anyway. Um. Well, sure. So, so multiple myeloma itself is a bone marrow cancer. Uh, it's a dan it's a cancer of uh, your immunoglobulins, your antibodies, where if you got exposed to an antigen or a new virus, let's say, or anything else that was unusual in your body, your typical body would make antibodies to that that would wipe them out. Um, there's uh, my body might make cancerous antibodies that would then go around and attack different parts of your body as if they're the enemy. Um, so it's, it's actually been a while now. It was eight years ago um, when this hit me. I, I had low back pain for a long time and went around and saw a bunch of different physicians and all of them said, well, you're getting old. And you know everybody gets back pain when they're your age. And they did a CT scan or an MRI of my spine and said, well, you got some fractures in your spinal column, uh, but you probably fell down and you uh, forgot. So nobody was thinking about maybe that I had this cancer that was actually attacking my vertebral column. And, and what happened one night about uh, a little over eight years ago was that I got up in the middle of the night because I wanted to use the bathroom and, and I stood up and I felt this bizarre feeling as best I can describe where I just fell back into the bed and I was in the most incredible pain I've ever been in my life and and I was able to nudge my wife and said honey I think you need to call 911 and she said shut up I'm sure you'll be fine in the morning go back to sleep <laughs> so I had to give her a couple more nudges and and then finally they did come in and it took like six ambulance personnel to carry me out in a stretcher I was in such bad shape what had happened is, you know, you've heard of different parts of the spine. My lumbar spine, the lower part of my back, completely collapsed upon itself, and I lost six inches of height that day. So you may remember, Chris, when I was younger, I was a fairly tall guy. I was 6'4". Yeah. I'm 5'10 now as a result wow. of this. And my back keeps still wondering eight years later where the rest of my back is. So it's kind of a constant pain thing, yeah. uh, which, you know, you learn to live with. Uh, but one of the things that's been fortunate is that I, I, I got it at the right time. There's been some wonderful advancements in treatment for this cancer in the last decade. If I had gotten this 15 years ago, I probably had had eight, 18 months to live. Sure. Because wow. of that organization that I donated to that's really funded a lot of research, now there's a lot of people who are able to live with this. And, and I have, I'm on a great chemotherapy I still get four times a month, and it's doing a great job. So, so, uh, so life's good. I don't, I don't really have many complaints in that 
that part. part. Um, and you know what? It's it's okay to be shorter. I used to like sit down at a ball game or a movie theater, and I'd hear the people behind me going, "Ah, oh, crap." <laughs> Nobody does that anymore. So, so I mean, there's always the silver way. lining. Yeah, yeah. So and and so, I, I'm sure there's mobility issues, uh, nevertheless, with with your new the the new shorter Scott or. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not all that active. Uh, I, I use a cane to get around and uh, I can't walk very far, but you know, when I'm sitting on Zoom, you'd never know it, right? I never know. Like anybody else. So, so like I said, things are good. Every, everybody's dealing with something. This just happens to me by particular thing. The one thing I will say based on all that other work that, that really changed, I think, because of this, when this first hit and, and I was in the most agonizing pain to think of, and there was still the estimates from those days that maybe you've got 18 months to live. Sure. Uh, oh, and I, I was told it on Valentine's day in 2012. That, that was a, that was a great day to be told because my wife was stuck in traffic and the doctor was like, well, I don't really have time, but anyway, just want to <laughs> let you know you got cancer. Okay. But uh, oh. here's my card call later. If you got any uh, questions. <laughs> <laughs> my wife came in and it's like, oh, well, what's, what's going on? Well, here's the card. <laughs> but but what, one thing that changed, and, and you've probably talked to other people in life uh, who have said things like this. When you get that, this, you know, when you're told that maybe you've got 18 months to live, suddenly you start thinking that every day is really important and really precious. Mm -hmm. And you really start changing your focus. And I knew there was so much that I wanted to do in my chosen profession that, that I had been kind of back burnering. And so like, you know, there's no time now to just screw around because I, I really want to make sure that, that, that these things happen. Cause I, I have these strong feelings like we can change the way we do things in the world. And I know these, these ideas work and I need to do studies to prove they work. Cause other, if I just tell people, here's an idea, nobody's going to believe it. But if I do a study and I can mm -hmm. back it up with solid data, then maybe they will. So it really changed my way of thinking so that I've got to do all these things I want to do and, and really get the word out because maybe I don't have all that much time. And, and even though I've been amazingly fortunate to, to be around for eight years rather than a year and a half, uh, that hasn't stopped me from thinking every single time uh, I have an opportunity to do something and not just professionally, you know, somebody calls you up and says, Hey, you want to go, out to dinner and maybe in the past you might have gone, eh, well, I don't know, I'm kind of yeah. tired today. Now you go, no, no, I want to go because maybe I won't be able to do that a month. So that's what's changed. Well, and this is the part that I, I mean, no. your your outlook with within the midst of all of this is so positive. I've written that down 13 times, positive outlook, positive outlook, right? And I, and, and I don't believe that that's insincere, right? I think that you have found a positive outlook that you are sort of uh, centering from. Where did that come from? Helping people? What, what is, because, you know, our, our market is email marketers plus, right? And I think that that idea of, uh, I mean, you've reframed everything to say, like, this is my chance to, I want to ride a bull named Fu Manchu, like, this is, you know, it, it, where does that, where does that positivity come from? Uh, great question. I, I guess what I would respond is, is that I've seen these kind of historic injustices done to people who are severely mentally ill. And I knew from our work that we could change that and that, that I needed to really just do everything I could to change that. And that makes me happy. And that makes me positive because so, so one of the things that I saw, and we haven't really got, we've talked about agitation, but one of the things that I've seen in my career is that if somebody has a serious uh, acute mental condition, now let's say it might be as simple, this could happen to your next door neighbor or somebody in your family, say they become suicidal. The traditional way of dealing with that is if you called 911 and said, I need help, my family member is wanting to kill themselves or, or is trying to kill themselves, what would happen is that the police would come, they'd put them in handcuffs for the crime of being suicidal, throw them in the back of a squad car, take them into an ER where they would often end up physically restrained and heavily sedated, 
because they didn't have that much else to offer them. And it wasn't right. the, far, the, the fault of the, the ER personnel. They were only doing what they were kind of told to do with their protocols. But what we had seen in our work was that none of this was necessary and you could get far better outcomes. They were putting people into restraints and, and, and heavily sedating them because they thought the only disposition they could find for these folks is transfer them to a psychiatric hospital. And as more and more people with behavioral health emergencies came to ERs, and that's now, the, it's like one out of every six or one out of every seven, one out of every eight people coming to ERs in the U.S. is there for a behavioral health emergency. So these are not rare. But imagine if behavioral health, you know, if another kind of emergency was treated this way, you know, is say that, oh, we don't really do cardiac cases at our ER, so we're just going to sedate you and try to find you uh, you know, a, a heart hospital. But that's basically what they do. They heavily sedate and they push them into a back hallway. And it's similar to, let's say you had an asthma attack and you came to the hospital, like barely able to breathe, I'm having asthma. Oh, great, well, just sit down. We're gonna start making some phone calls and we're gonna find you an asthma hospital. No, in ERs, you treat the case that's going on and you try to make people better. And according to federal law, psychiatric emergencies are equivalent to medical emergencies. You're supposed to treat them, you're supposed to make them better but nobody was doing that. So what we've really focused on is all these ways you can intervene, not just by doing de-escalation, but by engaging people into taking these oral medications that maybe the ER doctors weren't that familiar with, by getting people into separate spaces adjacent to the ER, which that's been our main work the last few years. We, we created a concept called empath units, which are which is an acronym that stands for Emergency Psychiatry Assessment, Treatment, and Healing Unit. And these are open spaces where when it, we know that the general ER is not a great space to be if you're having a psych emergency because there's lots of confinement and you're in restraints or you're with a sitter or with a security guard. If you try to get up, somebody's like, hey, get back in that bed or I'm calling security. Uh, and, and there's scary lights, sirens, and all kinds of you know, scary devices around, and it makes people feel worse and to get, uh, you know, more agitated, more into uh, the, the bad things going on. So what we've created is these spaces adjacent to the ER where instead of somebody being strapped to a bed, they choose a recliner, and it's an open space. It's almost like you're sitting around like at a group camp out. And you, if you, in your condition, feel like, oh, I really... Uh, would like to pace around, it helps me to calm down, it helps me relax. It's okay, nobody's gonna tell you you can't, you can move around. And there's space you can go and sit and watch TV or read a magazine or do a board game instead of just being confined in this little cubicle. And what we found, what's amazing, is that if you get people into this different space, they see a psychiatrist as quickly as possible, and we don't prejudge, we see how people respond to mm -hmm. treatment and only decide where they're going after a few hours, 75 to 80 percent of the people they thought needed to be hospitalized were able to get home in less than 24 hours. That's amazing. And that's that's an amazing thing because there's such a limited number of psych beds to begin with. Now we're actually going to only have those beds used for the people who have no alternative. Meanwhile, by giving people treatment in a more appropriate location with appropriate personnel at the right time, people get better and people get to go home. And we feel like home is a lot better place to, to be than in a locked psychiatric. Well, that, that fits right in line with what you were saying about choice earlier, right? It, what you just described was you're giving patients choice, right? Mm -hmm. uh, choose. Do you want to pace? If you want to pace, go pace. I don't, if, that, if that helps you, go pace, right? And, and nobody's um, telling you not to or they're going to call security. It, right. it's all about how do you find things that, that uh, prevent people from getting frustrated? So even like, for example, simple things like, in a traditional psych unit, you almost have to beg a nurse who's behind a bulletproof plexiglass fishbowl, yeah. can I get something to eat or I'm cold? We will set out food and beverages and extra gowns and you just serve yourself. And That's sometimes cool. people go, but wait, what if somebody makes a mess? I'm like, then we'll clean it up. What, what do you prefer, a mess or somebody getting in a fist fight? <laughs> I think we can deal right. with that, right? So well, I think some of the things. Also, we I mean, what also I think, you know, makes you special um, is that the work you're doing is amplified. In other words, you know, many, many physicians and doctors or psychiatrists, they, they treat pa their patients. But what you're trying to do with the textbooks that you write 
and and the you know the, the interviews that you give um and and you know you, you know and and we're really at the forefront of this new way of thinking um is is that you're amplifying it, it so that you're impacting not just how you treat patients right. and, and but how that, you know psychiatrists across the globe are treating patients and i think that's again remarkable that you know you, you're you know you're, again you're fighting through you know four times chemo a month and and you're you know leading global teams to settle set these guidelines i mean that that you know 20 30 40 years from now will still be you know i'm sure you know key guidelines for how how to treat these people and it, i mean right. to hear you talk about it, it's like it was dark. It means dark ages. Uh, you know how we continue to treat psychiatric patients was was. I, I mean, I, and again, you say it. It sounds when you say it, it sounds like how could we not have? I mean, what? How, how did we not think of that before? How did we think strapping a psychiatric somebody having a psychiatric breakdown to a gurney in an emergency room right. was the best course of action? And yet right. nobody questioned that until people like you started questioning that and. I mean, that's an amazing thing. And, and that's probably why, you know, you know, I, I got to admit, I mean, you know, Paul's well aware that in high school, uh, I was in Bye Bye Birdie. Um, Wait, what? He, he's very enamored <laughs> by that. He's very enamored by that story. We've talked about it on previous shows. In fact, we, I was sh showing some pillows and, and <laughs> other items that ha featured me from Bye Bye Birdie that we thought we might sell. And... <laughs> And there's a point to the story, Paul, not just for me to bring up Bye Bye Birdie again. And so for years, a picture of me, you know, everybody would say, oh, I went to the high school, went to the Dave Miller Theater, and there was a big picture of you on the wall, me, Chris Marriott from Bye Bye Birdie. And I thought, oh, that's great. You know, a little, a little bit of legacy of me, I'm on the wall. It wasn't called anything other than just, you know, it, it, it wasn't official. Well, then I find out that that's all been ripped out. And they've established this wall of fame. What? Yes, this wall of fame. And you know who's on the wall of fame? You know the first one I learned was on the wall of fame? Nope, Vince Vaughn. Yeah. Makes I don't even know who Vaughn. that is. And, and yes, you do. And, uh, and, um, but I, and which of course irritated me. But then I saw Scott Zeller was on there and I thought, well, if I have to come down, if my picture has to come down for all eternity so that people like Scott Zeller can be on this new wall of fame, well, I guess that's something I'm just, you know, I'm going to have to suck it up because, you know, I, I guess, I guess what he does is a little more important than starring in a high school musical. I don't, uh, it's, it's hard for me to agree with you here, Chris, but I'm going to, I'm going to. I want to say one thing. And I realized I threw a really hard question at you earlier, Scott, but I want to point out one of the things that I noticed. Um, I asked a really hard question and I was kind of driving at this concept of purpose. Like one of the things that it seems for you is you're very driven by purpose. Your purpose is how do, can I use the uh, education, passion around psychiatry, agitation, emergency room, and, and, and improve uh, for other folks. And, and it, it, you're very driven by that passion and that purpose, and I love that. What I saw was, uh, and this I think probably reflects your life as well, you transitioned it back to the passion and the purpose because that's where your heart is. And I thought that was this beautiful picture of, of your career, right? Like um, going from uh, uh, this, is, this is where I am and this is how I can help people. And, and I thought, what a beautiful, beautiful metaphor right now of that taking place. Is, is there a question there, Paul? No, I don't, I don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of rationale behind what I do, Chris. It's, it's, we all have but, I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a, I noted that that took place, and I thought that was actually a beautiful reflection of his career. That's all. Well, and I, it, it's what I touched on when I was talking about with you, Google Scott. I mean, he 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 wants the work to define him. It's clear to me that you want the work to define you. And I and again, I think that you know, I mean, it, it's such a great example, particularly for all of us who in our daily life go, oh, woe is me, I gotta deal with this. I'm, I'm locked down during the pandemic. I gotta wear a mask to the grocery store. Uh, you know, and, and, you know. Insert. I mean, you know, listen, listen to somebody like you, it hopefully helps other people, uh, it certainly helps me get over myself. <laughs> and, and, 
you know, realize that there are real people with real problems achieving great things. And I got a podcast with Paul, which is pretty good, right? <laughs> and there's a good chance. I mean, there's save a spot on the wall. That's all I'm saying, Scott. Keep it warm. for. This is my only hope, right? This is my only hope that maybe four years down the line, they'll say, well, all right, the podcast, good enough. But, but uh, they, the standards would have to be very much lowered. Um, but it is, it is my one hope. Um, Paul, do you have another question or do we go to the lightning round? Let's go to the lightning round. All righty. This, Scott, uh, is the where- This is the part that's scaring me, by the way. Are you no, 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 no. Oh, no, yeah, actually, no, we- I, I had a lot of fun. No, 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 because we're not going to, we're not going to play armchair psychiatrists, um, though we love to. Yes, um, I have dare, some ink blots. We wouldn't dare with psychiatrists. So again, the lightning round, as we explained in the prep, is I'm going to read you one word and you say whatever comes to mind, ideally a one word answer, but you know, we've in the past accepted longer answers. Um, okay. And we, we typically will pick one answer apart for what it may reveal uh, about uh, the person we're doing the lightning round. Now, this lightning round, let me pull them up. David, uh, Producer David, again, very wisely and subtly reminded me not to forget to do it. And he did uh, it perfectly too. So I have it prepared and I just can't pull it up. Uh, there we go. Um, uh, I'm gonna call this the Lake Forest edition. Oh. Ooh. Yes. So hold on, gotta, gotta pull it up again. All right. Okay, I wanna pull it up in a way that I can see the words and see you. Okay, so first word, <laughs> I'm so predictable. Is it birdie? Uh, no, <laughs> close, <laughs> uh, close enough. Uh, the first word in the lightning round is wall. No, I, I don't know if I can come up with one word on that. I mean, it, it was a wonderful thing to be elected to that wall of fame, but, um, you know, it, it was neat to be able to go back and see the high school. That was kind of the most fun part. Yeah, and the, my seventh grade social studies teacher is, was now the mayor of Lake Bluff. I think that was my coolest thing I saw that day. Well, and again, I, and I mean, let me make it clear. I'm jealous. I, 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 in, in no way, in no way am I mocking the Wall of Fame. I, I, I mean, I'm, je I'm jealous, I'm bitter, and I honestly do hope I would make it one day, but I don't think I will. But no, in no way do we want to take that from you. That, that, is, that is a huge honor. When you see the other people that are on that Wall of Fame, one of whom we're going to have next week. We're not going to say who, uh, but, oh. one, but one we, we're going to have another one uh, on next week. Um, but uh, no, and, and I think that is a tremendous honor and well-deserved. So again, if, 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 if I sounded uh, like I wasn't serious about it, uh, apologies, I think it's a great thing. Uh, Paul, what happened to you? I don't know. All right, but you're still there. Okay. Oh, there, here, Paul's back. Okay. <laughs> One thing I will say is that uh, I don't think anybody would have guessed when we were seniors in high school that I would have been the one to end up on that wall. And I kind of said that in my acceptance uh, when I got to speak to the entire current senior class that year and said, you know, what you're going through now in high school, things might be really different a few years from now and just keep at it and don't let things get you down. I, you know, actually, I think that is a great message for high school, Steve, because uh, I mean, again, I, I think, um, you know, I, I was talking to Betsy, my wife the other day, Betsy Filer. Um, Who was our and, classmate as well. Right, and we were talking about this and, and I said, you know, all the, all the big men on campus, you know, none of them, uh, you know, ever had a shot, will have a shot, had a shot at the, uh, at, at the Wall of Fame. It's the, it's the people that, well, except Chris Merritt, I see, thanks to your, your Wall of Fame, Paul, I appreciate that. <laughs> You're, I appreciate that. It's only I'll got one name, again. though. That's the only. That's the I, only I think, challenge. Right, it's right. I'm the only one on that wall of fame. But but I think that's a great message, Scott. It, it, it is that yeah. I mean, you know, we didn't have a wall of fame then, but but you know, when you look at all the senior superlatives and who's most likely to make it, and this or that, um, it's it's never those kids who actually do make it. And I think you're a prime example of someone who who you know went on to do unbelievable. Well, as we talked about the whole show, great things. And, and nobody would have necessarily pegged that you weren't going to do it, but n neither would they have necessarily pegged that you were going to do it. It was, you know, uh, we didn't know you as well as we know you now. I knew you because of the swim team. That Paul, right, what's no the more next word, Chris? What's the next word? All right, no word. Next word, Deer Pack. Oh, gosh. Uh, theater? Okay, very good. 
That was that was one. Good, so that's a uh, Deer Path Golf Course, Deer Path Inn, Deer Path Theater, Deer Path Theater, which no longer shows movies. But good answer. Doesn't it? No, no has not for years. It's it's uh, uh, it's like it's like a small mall. I, I mean, I don't go in it, uh, but the the marquee is still there. <laughs> Look at Paul. Sorry, Paul. Small town politics. I know you live in Chattanooga, big city boy. That's uh, right. You know, the Deer Path Theater is where I originally saw uh, American Graffiti. And just a couple weeks ago, my son, who just graduated from high school, and I watched it together. Really? And it made me really flash back to seeing it at that theater and, and how it's kind of such a great movie to uh, about how you move into adulthood. Yes. And, and that kind of last night of still being a kid. And, uh, you know, he just looked at it and was like, yeah, whatever, Dad. <laughs> how come it's not in HD? Right. <laughs> right. And why uh, is the right. music so terrible? Number three, hot dog. That's a real one out of left field. I don't know where I could get that. I don't know. Baseball? Uh, no, the, that one maybe the one we come back to. There was, there was a classic place in, in Lake Forest uh, known for its hot dogs, either known as Pasquazi's or the Pasquazi's, Lake Bank. sure, yeah. I don't know that yes. I would have thought of that. Uh, and Dave well, Pasquazi was our classmate, too. Right, and it, who now is is a star of of the small screen, and uh, he's been in many many uh, TV shows. David has been in many TV shows. Oh, no kidding! I didn't realize that. Yeah, look at look it up. He's been in a, um, a an ensemble member of, of several shows. Yeah, another guy I'm jealous of because I've never been on TV. Um, I'm jealous of a lot of people. We'll find. Uh, you made the wall, Chris. <laughs> I made made the wall. That's awesome. Uh, next one, uh, Oasis. Good grief, these are all, I don't know, terrible 20-year-old uh, rock band? Oh, I actually like that. That wasn't what I was looking for, but I like that a lot. No, that- so you come in with a, you come in looking for something, Chris? Sometimes I do. very lightning -y to me. But, are you thinking of the Tollway Oasis? In yes, Lake Forest? boom, there we go, yes. <laughs> See, no, he got it, he got it. Yes, <laughs> there is a- uh, on the tollway in Illinois, they have what they call oasises, and they're every 20 miles or so, and they're where you get gas and McDonald's food, and Paul, you'd probably get, you know, a, uh, uh, you know, a, a one of those Cinnabons that yep, you like. Yep, that's correct. Um, mm -hmm. And Lake Forest has a, one, there, so it's the Lake Forest Oasis. So that's it's what actually, I was looking It's actually in Roundout, though. It's not even in Lake Forest. I was going to say, I thought it was in Roundout, too, Chris. What, yeah. what kind of no, false information are you spreading? They here? call it the Lake Forest Oasis, though. Yeah, I'm gonna check. I'm going to check that. I will check that. I, I will report back on that. Uh, and the last one is Lantern. Oh, the place that uh, I didn't have a fake ID, so I couldn't go, but everybody I knew was going to exactly. when we were in high school. And I think... Actually, it's still going, right? The last oh, time was absolutely. at Lake Forest, we went there. Well, that was not the going, Lake Forest it's, pub. It's three times as big as it was when we were in high school because as uh, Lake Forest Hardware uh, closed and they expanded there and then Lake Forest uh, something or else expanded. So it's much bigger than, than the old bar that it was. Uh, Paul, it was called the Lantern. Uh, here's interesting because it's right across from the train tracks and the old, you know, lanterns sure. used to... Uh, you know, alert trains or whatever. Um, classic Lake Forest establishment. So, um, you know, I think you did. I, there's not much I can go into. You know, disappointed on the uh, hot dog answer. Uh, oh, no. uh, Oasis. I liked both. I mean, you. you I like the band answer. Uh, Paul. I mean, do you have any any? I should have been thinking with the Lake Forest lens, though. I, I, I I'll be honest. I've never. I don't think I've ever been to Lake Forest, Chris. So I, I don't have a lot to contribute here. Well, <laughs> I have a question for you, Chris. Was Stan Bonk's Barbershop next door to the lace, to the Lantern? Did they take that over? That's one of, one of, yeah, I think you're right. I think that is one of the stores they took over. And Chambers. I, I was going to say, the Chamber, well, no, there's nothing in Chambers. Chambers, Paul, you, what, you would have been a frequent customer, I'm sure. That was the, what was known in those days as a head shop. Okay. You had to go downstairs to get into it. Yeah, That's the only place in Lake Forest you could buy rock posters for your wall. I yeah, the, the black light rock posters and, and those smoking tubes for tobacco. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. Only for use with tobacco. Uh, anyway, uh, Scott, this has been a, a tremendous conversation. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, you know, I, I, I mean, I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm without words. I'm without speech because it, 
I, I can't say enough about how, how great it's been to talk to you, how great it's been to catch up with you um, and, and hear about your career and just how unbelievably amazing it is. Uh, again, you know, our hearts go out. I don't want to be overly sympathetic because you, your attitude is, hey, it's, you know, I have it, I'm dealing with it. But, you know, you do have our sympathies uh, for what that's worth that, uh, again, not, no, you know, just because nobody should have to go through that and we're sorry, but again, it, it, it in, in fact doesn't seem to slow you down, but as you said, sped you up. You're doing more um, and you're seizing each day. And uh, um, right. that's amazing. And, and we're gonna continue uh, to, you know, expect to see great things from you. And, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I haven't talked to him yet. He's there in the background, fan favorite producer, David Inman, but I would imagine he's already scribbling you in as onto his invite, his coveted invite back list. So, um, oh, I'd love that. Yeah, we'd love to catch Very up with you again uh, at some point in the future. Um, Paul, you have anything else uh, that you want no, to No, just so grateful to get to spend some time with you today and, you know, really want to send you off to continue doing the great work you're doing. Yep. Thank you. It was, it was really fun to be part of this. Good. Thanks. Really appreciate it. Thanks, and thanks everybody, for tuning in. <laughs> and we're back with the post show. That was a very, very good show. Uh, Fantastic show, yeah. I thought Scott did did was an amazing job. I'm very proud of that, and and uh, um, good to have that uh, added to the list. And 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 David, um, we see you're uh, working from the bowling alley today. Yeah, I figure it's it's about that time. Me and my buddies, we both got tested this past weekend, and we're in the clear, so we figured we hit the lanes. Nice. So no no issues with masks or anything. Uh, no, you just gotta pass the tests at the door, and then you're good. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Tennessee, I'm sure man. Those, Tennessee. I'm sure, the, I'm sure those tests are, are very, very detailed. I, I came prepared this week. I, 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 I brought one of my, because I, I realized last week I was talking about the big hats and the small hats and the baseball oh, yeah. hats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I'm sorry if you're listening. You're not, you're not going to, this is a visual. Um, so Trey McIntyre, if you're still, li and he's one of our big fans. Big, huge respect, fan. We respect his input. He's the one who pointed out that we often show things and don't describe that. Yeah. Um, so we've been learning from him. But anyway, I was talking last week about how regular hats, how, how, how I had to set them so they could fit. So he here's one of my big, big head hats. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll, you'll notice when I get up to the camera, you'll notice that I have it yeah. all the way over. I mean, and that's what normal people in hats do. Were this a regular sized hat, that, that you guys all can wear, in order for it to fit my head, I would have to have it set at that. All that is not even true. Again. Put that all on your the, head. Put it on now. It's, 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 it's falls off. I mean, it's so big at that level. Right, so I don't, I'm, I'm calling you out and saying that's not true. No, there, there, I mean. Yeah, that's a nice fit. So what do you got, what's it on now? It's not on the, the last digit. No, it's it's well, 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 well over. Almost, I can almost go all the way. Oh, but you're saying this is an abnormally large hat. Right, that's what I'm saying. This right, this is a big oh, head I hat. So I can I see because you can imagine how nervous you are if you're down like this. Yeah. Well, plus the judgment when you walk down the street and people see how that little plastic strappy thing it looks like that right. wide open like that. It's I mean, on, back of the bus. On. Holding on, I mean, I'm always afraid that that little thing is going to clamp. And my hat's going to fall off. It's right. Just one, one Sudden of these wind. Little, You're in Chicago. Right. The windy right. city. Windy city. One of these little things can break off, and I just got four or five holding that hat on. Where I wearing a, a normal size hat? I'm, I'm that is one that little special, thing. Special so, order. Special. So order. this is special order hat from Lamoods. Uh, big hat company head company um you wait do no there's a specialty big head company hat company yeah big, oh yeah it's a website it's specialty a website. big head hats yep. no that's i mean some might say it's a little bit niche i don't think so that's what the internet was made for i mean what would, would a big head hat store survive in the mall i don't think so but on the internet's Right. Big head hat stores. I mean, there are enough of us out there, I, you know, and they charge a premium. I mean, um, what would you pay for this hat? What would you, what would you think you'd pay for this hat? 
Uh, it's got a nice star on it, white brim, yep. black hat. Yep. I don't know, $45. Oh, 50? you're ruining my... You're... <laughs> Did I go too high? Was I supposed to go low? Tell me. Help me this here, was like, Well, let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. Yes, it was too high. That hat, that hat, um, this hat cost me 24 bucks. Now, okay. That's a screaming this, deal. This hat, no, this email connect hat. Nice. Well done. Cost me seven bucks. But, but the problem is I can't wear it. I have to, I have to give them away. Why right, can't I wear it? Because you have such a large head. Because I have such a large head. I cannot get the, I cannot. <laughs> I mean, your I head is it. enormous, Marriott. Which is, I guess, why I'm a good, uh, you know, I look good on TV. But All right, yeah. so when we're talking about niche. I can't, I can't wear my own company's hat. Oh, my goodness. Niche. Nice that is, too. Niche store in the mall. Um, Ned Flanders had one uh, in the Simpsons, Simpsons. And I'm betting that David Inman knows the name of it. Do you remember the name of the store? Uh, I knew it was for lefties, left-handed people, but I don't remember what the name was. Leftorium. Leftorium, yeah. <laughs> All right. I've got something to share, too, Chris. Okay. Go ahead. So, uh, wife is gone. Uh, so, I'm here with the three oldest boys. And um, uh, one of them has been on his little phone. And it's, it's not Craigslist, but it's a similar service. And, and it's a buy and sell service, right? And so, he comes to me and he goes, Dad, we got to get this poster. And I was like, what is it? And he's like, it's a big Tabasco bottle. And I was like, I was like, tell me about this big Tabasco bottle, right? And he's like, it's a- uh, oh, Wait, for those listening at home, Paul is showing us now a poster of a big Tabasco bottle. It's framed. And I was like, well, and, and so the other thing is it's an hour away. The, so it's a free poster, but we had to drive an hour to nowhere's Georgia to get this, okay? <laughs> and so I said, you know, I'm like, I'm not driving to nowhere's Georgia today. No. So, but the, so overnight, I sleep on and I'm like, no, no, we have to go. We have to, right? So we get there. We drive. I get all the boys in the car. I'm like, we're going. And we drive. And you can see, like, this, uh, the poster is water stained. Right, you I was going to say, there seems to be, yeah, it's, it's not in pristine. Uh, no, not in any way, shape, or form, right? So we get there uh, after driving for an hour, and, you know, uh, backwoods, picture it, right? And a uh, guy's like, here you go. And I was like, this is so great. I got this cool hot, hot sauce poster, right? And he's like, I've got other posters, too, if you want them. Other pictures, San Francisco. I got a picture of a cat. All yours. <laughs> And I was like, this, this is spectacular, right? And um, we ended up only walking away with, with the hot sauce poster. But to, he had a, and this is not a, a political uh, slant. I do have those too. But he had a hand-drawn sticker on his car that said Trump Pence, if that gives you any sense of what we're doing. Like super, like amazing guy, right? Anyway, all that said, uh, it was about the adventure. Right. And I think that part of uh, what I'm doing in life right now with the kids and everything going on is how do we make big stories? Right. And this big story was around a sweet Tabasco picture that we had to drive an hour for that has water stains on it. Like my hope is that this will go up in my son's house for the rest of his life. But in the meantime, is your wife going to let you put it up anywhere in your house? You know, probably not. You know, the chances are low. Um, it, it was, it's hanging in Noah's room right now as a, as a trophy. He's pretty excited about it. Yeah, I, I found getting wall hangings uh, of, of my choice uh, is an unpopular pastime in yeah. this house. Yeah, <laughs> garage. You know, that's often where those, those wall hangings end up. You can put it in the garage, Chris. Right, right. Or my office. My office has a, a number of, well, I mean, it, it's got the stuff that was wife approved, right, uh, the, right. the diplomas and stuff. But um, what you can't see are the, are the Chris approved. What's a, uh, what's a Chris approved wall hanging? Uh, well, there's, a, there's, a, there's the painting of, of my dog, Newman. Um, there's the clock. I, I like this. This is given to me. I'm excited. So much this of this is, is what I always by, want. 
by one of my boys for Christmas. It's, it's a 45? Yeah, it's a 45 record of Monty Python's uh, Always Look on the Bright Side of Life. Which is a great song. Turned into a clock. Perfect. I, I love it. I love it, but it's in my office. Right, because that, that's probably not wife-approved living room clock. Or, or, right, or, I mean, you know, I, I made a mistake of, 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 of uh, actually, somebody, speaking of your story of, of the Tabasco, um, I'd gotten her a 3D uh, uh, rendition of Camp Randall, which is University of Wisconsin's football field. Right. And, and she loves Wisconsin football. and She, she loves, loves the Badgers. Badgers. And, and I thought, she'll love this. Of course. Well, hang it. Well, it did get hung. So, <laughs> so I, I, I was going to throw it out, and I thought, that's a damn shame. So I offered it up on a Facebook group, uh, where, which is for selling things in, in the area. Uh, and I just said, this is free. Anybody want it? And this woman who lived in town's husband went there and she said, yeah, I'll take it if it's free. And uh, so she drove over, just like you drove over. She drove over. I gave it to her. She couldn't, just like you, she was as giddy as you. She could not believe her luck in getting this for her husband. But there's more. A couple of days later, I get an email from her. Yeah, Leah Paul is like, how could there be more? This story is the best story. I mean, Leah Davies like, I couldn't possibly believe this story would get better. And it is. And it does. So a couple of days later, I get an email from her saying, you know what? My husband and I got tickets to go see this trio doing the uh, um, uh, Charlie Brown. This was December. And it was a Charlie Brown, uh, the Vince Girardi. Giraldi. Right, right. Uh, it wasn't the Vince Giraldi, but they were, they were doing that whole, the sure. whole mute album that he put together, uh, Christmas album. She said, I can't use them. Would you like them? One of my wife's favorite things is that album. That's what she plays at Christmas. So I said, sure, I'll take those two tickets. And we went to see the concert. So, and so was, you, got, you got tickets by giving away a free poster. Right. That's and, spectacular. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was like karma. It was, it was, do, you, it was, do you stay in touch with this person? No. Do you still no. have her contact info? Somewhere. I'm thinking we should get her on the show, Chris. <laughs> yeah, that'd be five minutes of discussion. And how, what did you think when you saw this free Camp Randall 3D rendition? Did you think this is too good to be true? Did you think, uh, I, you know, I, I'm going to go there and I'm going to be held up at gunpoint uh, because that's such a great lure? Who, right. would, who wouldn't show up? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Great show this week, Chris, yeah. David. Um, excited for folks to get to hear Scott, his perspective. and Yes. And, and another great show coming up next week uh, where we have an award-winning author of both books for adults and young adults um, who I think you'll find uh, 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 equally interesting to Scott. She's got a great story to tell. And uh, Paul and I are, are very excited to have her on the show. So... Uh, more about that later in the week when we do our great reveal that mm -hmm. I know you've all come uh, you've all come to expect to see on Thursday. Though sometimes Paul doesn't get it to me until Friday, um, but we'll get the great reveal out later this week. And uh, thanks again for uh, your support of the show. And Paul, this is where you do the send emails to. Or... Yep, yep. As always, let us know how things are going, thoughts you have, uh, guests you might want to see, topics covered. All of the above. We now have a Twitter account. I believe it's coffee underscore email. Um, like, follow, favorite, all those things with that. Um, yep. You know, as always, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. It gives us uh, sort of nice, subtle cues that things are going well. Um, comment on the, on the things. If you like the content you're seeing, share it with the people you care about. And, and, and lastly, you know, maybe we'll add something new to the show uh, next week. Um, you know, maybe maybe we'll add a section uh, at the end of the show. Uh, ask fan favorite David Inman anything. Oh, I like and that. So send in questions that you would like Paul and I to, to ask. ask fan favorite David Inman any question, uh, and we will select a couple and uh, ask fan favorite David Inman your question. So we want to help you get involved with the show, and um, and uh, we all enjoy how quick on his feet uh, fan favorite is. So 
It'll be a great way to combine his talents with your talents of coming up with questions. Sounds good. All right. Well, everybody, thanks again. We'll see you next week. Sounds good.